everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our last Trust Talk of 2020. I can't believe it. Um, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Trust Talks is a monthly series where we share scholarship from um, emerging scholars with professionals in their field. And we are so excited tonight to share um, Melissa King's research. Um, Melissa King currently serves as a Samuel, Samuel H. Kress Fellow in Preventive Conservation at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, but she has held many positions within the field of conservation prior to that. She has been at the MFA Boston the Nat and worked with the National Park Service. She's worked for Historic New England, the Peabody Museum, the Kelsey Museum, and English Heritage. Along with that, she is also a graduate of the Winter Program in Art Conservation, and we are so thrilled to share her work within the field of preventive conservation with you this evening. Um, Trust Talks is also supported by the Marie and John Zimmerman Fund, and we are so grateful for their ongoing support of emerging decorative arts scholars. If uh, programming like this is interesting to you, please go ahead and follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, and be sure to check out our YouTube page to find more of our Trust Talk lectures. After all of our um, online lectures, we re-host them on our YouTube page. So if at any point you need to sneak away from the screen, maybe to get a snack, don't worry. You can always check back in with this lecture um, about a week after it airs when we post it on our YouTube. Uh, so without further ado, I am happy to bring Melissa King up to the virtual podium and welcome her to uh, speak with you all this evening. Thank you so much, Carrie. All right, I am so pleased that you invited me here this evening. I love talking about preventive conservation. I think it will be pretty clear early on in this presentation how much I love preventive conservation. And it's something that relates to all of you. Everyone has objects that you care about and you wish to preserve. And hopefully you will learn some things in this presentation that will help you better achieve that goal. I am speaking from my office in Medford, Massachusetts. And I acknowledge my work happens on the unceded traditional territories of the Mashpee, Wampanoag, Akina, Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and Massachusetts uh, tribal nations. I recognize and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and the people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. In order to understand how I landed in the world of preventive conservation, I thought I might share a bit of my background with you. Before getting into graduate school, I worked many years getting experience in the conservation treatment of objects, paintings, textiles, and paper. I loved learning about every material, and I especially enjoyed communicating concepts of conservation to people outside of our unique little field. I would be remiss if I failed to acknowledge the many barriers to enter the field of conservation. And while graduate schools are actively addressing this, we still have a long way to go. In 2017, my dream finally came true when I was accepted into graduate school at the Winterthur University of Delaware program in art conservation. During your first year of graduate school, you get training in all types of conservation specializations before you choose your focus. Some of my classmates came in knowing exactly what they wanted to focus in, but I was drawn to pretty much every specialization. In my year, we were given the option of a new major in preventive conservation. The more I learned about preventive conservation and realized how interdisciplinary the work was and how important communication was, the more I realized it was the right specialization for me. Preventive conservation has always been an essential part of our field. The text on the screen is the first principle in the American Institute for Conservation's Code of Ethics. And it describes our duty as conservation professionals for practicing preventive conservation. The Code of Ethics was recently revised in 1994 and only semi-recently have we come to acknowledge preventive conservation as a specialization in its own right. And now with the established preventive major at Winneter, it will surely continue to grow. There are currently three preventive majors in the two classes behind me and more to come. It is also important to recognize that there are many paths to becoming a preventive conservator and mine is definitely not the only way. So what is preventive conservation? I have been finding that one of the best ways to describe it to the public is to expand upon the analogy we often use to consider art conservators as art doctors. You may make the comparison between a primary care physician and a surgeon. 
While most conservators are specialists in particular materials, as a surgeon might be specialist in hearts or brains, a preventive conservator has a general understanding of all materials and offers holistic care for entire collections. In conservation, instead of human patients, we work with cultural heritage. So instead of prescribing medicine or encouraging a healthy diet, I may prescribe specific light levels in a protective display case. My hope as a preventive conservator is to do everything I can to limit the need for interventive treatment by managing risks. A method to organize the framework for preventive conservation is to consider the major risks for deterioration. I made these illustrations earlier this year to represent the 10 agents of deterioration, which were identified by scientists at the Canadian Conservation Institute and the Canadian Museum of Nature. I will be going through each of these agents to describe what they are, how we manage them, and offer some suggestions for how you may address them within your own collections. You may be surprised by how much you are already practicing preventive conservation. First, I will discuss the agent physical forces. Physical forces encompasses the risk of impact, shock, vibration, pressure, and abrasion. These can be caused by an earthquake, mishandling, overcleaning, bumping into an object, construction, loud music, and even deformation of an object from gravity over time. In conservation, we have methods to monitor vibration and mitigate it through padding. We promote object handling skills, and these are useful for everyone. There are many excellent videos online that go over handling techniques, such as this video uh, from the State Library of Queensland. If you, don't have, if you don't have one already, you might consider getting one of these uh, hockey brushes. Uh, dust can be quite abrasive and can create noticeable damage over time. And this is a safe way to, to clean dust off the surface of objects. We, op uh, we often build custom storage and shipping support for fragile objects. And you can also create physical supports for some of your objects in storage, such as bulked acid-free tissue paper to prevent creases in textiles and flat rigid storage for two-dimensional works. This is an image of me testing a custom brass mount uh, at, uh, for an Egyptian stone sculpture at the Brooklyn Museum. It was about to head out on loan to Missouri, which as you can see from this uh, geological survey map has a higher risk of seismic activity. We had to ensure the object was carefully packed for transport and that, at, and that the mount could withstand tremors if it, if it were to happen. Some of these things may seem obvious, but they are important reminders. It's worth noting how protective a mat and frame can be for two-dimensional artwork to minimize handling and create a rigid support. There is always a certain level of risk when we place fragile objects at certain heights with mobile creatures, such as this cat. Uh, other things to consider might be polyester sleeves for your photographs, padded hangers for textiles if you can't store them flat. Uh, it's always a good idea to have acid free, uh, free tissue on hand to just create a bulked material uh, for support for your objects in storage. And another great idea is old bed sheets uh, made out of cotton are acid free and an excellent material for packing and storing objects as well. And flat folders for your flat objects as well. The next agent I will discuss is fire. We probably all associate fire as one of the most devastating risks, as you might re recall the fire in Brazil and the Notre Dame. And we're not wrong considering how it has the power to completely decimate collections and destroy historic buildings. Thankfully, we can rely, heavily rely on the groundwork of fire risk specialists to mitigate this risk through early detection alarms distinguishing methods and fire codes that control airflow, ignition, and fuel sources. It is a good idea for cultural heritage institutions to develop relationships with their local first responders. In some instances, it is possible to do reciprocal trainings with them to understand fire prevention strategies and share your own salvage and response plans for your collections. The image at the top right is from a training offered by the Smithsonian's Pan-Institutional Initiative Price which stands for the Preparedness and Response and Collections Emergency. I was really fortunate to take part in this training last year. And, and during this training, uh, they created a mock collection storage unit uh, and they set it ablaze in a controlled fire at the ATF Fire Research Laboratory. Smithsonian collection staff practice documenting, salvaging and recovering objects. Practicing for emergencies is a crucial part of collections preparedness. Soot from fires can cause discoloration and damage from its acidic nature. As you can see here, um, one thing to consider is when soot is deposited on porous materials, unlike this glass, um, time is not on your side when it comes to remediation and these objects may need attention sooner than you think. 
Of course, human safety should always trump the protection of collections, and it is crucial to consider our emotional well being during disasters. Uh, other things I wanted to mention was related to fire, uh, the consideration of placing paintings above your fireplace, that's obviously uh, potentially a big risk. And um, it's always a good idea to have an inventory of your collection if you can. This can be really useful for insurance claim, claims and recovery and triage later. The next agent of deterioration is, is biodeterioration. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> As the name suggests, biodeterioration encompasses damages caused by living things such as insects, rodents, lichen, and mold. Certain insects and mold species enjoy eating proteins such as fur, leather, uh, fur, feathers, leather, and certain glues. Others enjoy the starches found in textiles, paper, and adhesives. And there are some that are keen at munching away at cellulose such as wood, paper, and other plant materials. A lot of this damage is encouraged through damp environments and the buildup of dust. Other pests to consider are rodents that may bury pieces, borrow pieces of your collection to build their nests. There are many ways to mitigate the risk of biodeterioration. You, you can make improvements to the building envelope by minimizing gaps and points of entry for insects, as you can see in this door sweep right here. Dust is uh, filled with easily digestible fragments of cellulose, starch, and protein that attracts insects and mold alike. One of the best things you can do to maintain an active, uh, one of the things the best things you can do is to maintain an active housekeeping reg regimen to minimize the building of buildup of dust. There you go. Temperature and humidity can deter and attract pests. So try your best to minimize prolonged moisture. Historically, people have used pesticides to prevent insect damage on organic objects. If you have an old object made out of edible materials such as fur and skin, and there's little to no damage on it, be aware that it may contain, contain da dangerous chemicals. There's a reason it wasn't eaten. Um, you may need to take certain precautions when handling these objects, such as wearing gloves and masks. You'd be surprised how many pesticides are out there. So really be careful. You can also minimize the risk of pests by restricting food and drink to certain areas that are not close to collection items. Since like dust, these crumbs are pest attractants. In conservation, we utilize a technique called integrated pest management or IPM which is adapted from the agricultural industry to minimize the use of pesticides. With IPM, we set up sticky traps or blunder traps around the building and monitor them for the types of insects we find. The data we collect from these traps can be indicative of a certain pest problem, and they can also be an early warning sign of a larger pest problem. You can be a weirdo like me and set these up in your own house maybe it's not weird, I don't know, and tracked what kind of pests you find in your house. Um, thankfully, I mostly just found spiders when I started doing that at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and believe it or not, those are actually good pests to have because they like to eat all the pests that we don't like. So keep them around if you can. Uh, so, um, so one other thing is uh, this enclosure right here is a CO2 chamber. And this is something that we use, this is from the Winter Term Museum and, and other institutions use things like this and also freezers as ways to kill the entire life cycle of a pest be with objects before they enter into the collection. It's a preventive measure, even if you don't know if there are pests in those objects. Uh, so uh, this is actually something that you could do yourself, potentially not a CO2 chamber, but um, you can practice isolation, which is something that we are all familiar with during this pandemic, um, but it's the same thing with your objects. So if you get an object from maybe a suspicious area, uh, especially if it's made out of fur or feathers or other tasty morsels, you could consider putting, um, putting it on top of a, a white piece of paper and wrapping it in plastic and keeping it, keeping it outside your collection or at least secured uh, in the plastic within your collection and you can monitor it for a period of time to see if frass starts to form on the paper. And what frass is, is insect poop actually. And that's really what's gonna tell you if there's an active infestation or not. Um, one other thing to know is these bubbles are potentially uh, available commercially. I know that Historic New England offers this as a service to people if you happen to have a large pest outbreak, and I'm sure there are plenty of other around the country. Um, another, other things to know is thinking about where you store things in your house. 
Uh, avoid storing things for long periods of time in your attic or in your basement where things tend to be a little bit more humid or undisturbed. Pests really do enjoy things like they don't enjoy being dis disturbed. So if you have an old fur coat, take it out of your closet every once in a while, expose it to the light, shake it around a little bit, and that actually can, can do wonders in terms of building up a pest population. Really a good rule of thumb is we are most comfortable as human beings in a very similar environment to our collections. So some of the best places to store things if possible are where you live, uh, spend most of your time in your bedroom, under your bed is ideal, but obviously we can't store everything there. So the next risk is incorrect temperature. Extreme temperatures can create a host of problems. At high heat, you can risk melting certain materials. And in the case of this archeological pot right here, it was the adhesive that joined it that softened in the high heat. Uh, many chemical reactions leading to, uh, there are many chemical reactions that lead to degradation such as acid hydrolysis, which is uh, endothermic, meaning that it is catalyzed by heat. So things degrade a little bit quicker at higher heat. Uh, some cultural institutions have opted to store photographs and plastics in lower temperature storage specifically to slow down the rate of deterioration. Freezing temperatures can cause certain materials to embrittle, such as this painting right here. And of course, a frozen pipe can create a host of other problems. One of the best ways to control temperature is to create good insulation. This can be done in shipping containers and in buildings themselves. Another uh, thing to consider is the fact that certain things can produce heat such as this incandescent bulb right, bulb right here. If you're worried about melting points for certain materials, you can usually find this information on their safety data sheets, which are searchable on the internet for any commercial product. Uh, another thing to note, just going back to the light bulbs, our LEDs are becoming more popular because of their energy efficiency, which is great. But another added benefit of LED lights is they do not produce as much infrared as other lights. So that's a good bonus. The next agent of deterioration is incorrect relative humidity. When the relative humidity is too high for a long enough period of time, it can cause metal to corrode and encourage the growth of mold. Certain insects also prefer a high humidity environment. An environment that is too dry can cause cracking in organic objects. Another risk with relative humidity is humidity fluctuations. So this archeological pot right here uh, was filled with soluble salts. So when it was buried in the ground um, and the ground was wet, salts were able to enter into the, the pores of the ceramic. And when the humidity went low, those salt crystals could recrystallize within the, the framework of the ceramic and cause spalling, which is something that you might see like old brick uh, buildings. You can start to see some of the, the pieces of it start to break away. So that salt damage caused by transitioning uh, relative humidity. And uh, also we have to worry with, with humidity changes uh, specifically about composite objects. So objects that are made of layers of different materials. And one of the most common things that come to mind is a painting, which is extremely layered. If you think about it, it has a uh, textile with maybe a, a protein size, uh, like a gesso made out of protein and paint. And all of these materials are gonna to respond to the humidity at different rates. So the textile will expand and then the paint will crack and fall off. And so that's a, a really big concern with changing humidity. In order to manage relative humidity, in the US we are highly dependent on HVAC systems to mechanically control buildings. We can also employ microclimates with the use of showcases by utilizing sorbents such as silica gel to maintain humidity passively. So this is actually the stuff that you get in your beef jerky. We utilize something very similar um, for showcases. Uh, so cardboard um, such as this acid-free box has the ability to buffer the environment and prevent fluctuations at the object level. We often monitor the environment to get a sense of the mechanical performance and potential risks. This is done through the placement of sensors that can log data over time or take singular readings known as spot readings. Um, kind of going back to what I was saying in terms of insects, it's important to think about the locations in your house um, and where things might be more humid than other may experience more fluctuations in particular the attic and the basement aren't necessarily the best place to store things but that's 
kind of naturally where we like to store things because we, that's where we have space. Um, another thing is maybe this is obvious, maybe it's not. Uh, bathrooms are really humid places and I can't tell you the amount of people I've known that have wanted to, to hang their artwork in the bathroom and um, I might not recommend that. Another thing to, to consider is if you do have to put something in a humid area, um, air movement can be really helpful. Um, so maybe setting up a fan um, every once in a while just to keep the airflow that can actually help with the humidity. The next risk is pollutants. Pollutants are chemicals often in the air that can cause deterioration. When metal corrodes or tarnishes, it is the chemical reaction to its surroundings. Volatile acids can be especially damage, damaging to carbonate-based materials such as shells and limestone. You can see here, this is Bynes disease, which happens from uh, solid, uh, vapor, from acids in the air, uh, volatile acids. And some materials are inherently more acidic and can off-gas volatile acids, such as wood and paper products made with wood pulp. So this old wooden showcase, uh, typically it's it's fresh cut wood that we're seeing more of the volatile acids come off. Um, so if it's been around for a while, it, it should be it should be okay. Um, but really, um, that's something to consider if you have things that are extra vulnerable to acid. Uh, this, so these kind of things are important to consider when you are storing collections items for or displaying collections for a long period of time with some of these materials, especially if they're in an enclosed environment because it can cause reactions to the materials. Uh, one other thing to note is that we also categorize dust in the category of pollutants um, and it can be damaging. A, a lot of times dust can actually be acidic and cause some irreversible damage to objects. So something to consider as well. We have some tools um, that we use to measure for pollutants. Um, these right here are 80 strips and they are pieces of paper you can place within your collections and it will indicate by color the level of acetic acid. And we are particularly concerned about acetic acid with cellulose acetate, uh, old film. Uh, and you may have noticed, or if you've ever been to a library, sometimes you can smell a vinegar smell and that's the materials degrading and uh, producing this um, vinegar smell, which is unfortunate because that vinegar smell deteriorates not only that object itself, but the collections around it. So it is um, definitely a major conservation ch challenge, figuring out what to do about these self-degrading objects that put off um, pollutants. Uh, we also have some, some fancy analytical techniques that we use. Um, this is Maddie Cooper, who is a preventive major the year behind me, working with SPEMI, which is solid, solid phase material extraction that is run through a GCMS uh, mass spectrometry column uh, to identify what volatiles are in the air um, with a certain material that you might measure. Um, we also have these are called dra Drager tubes. There's thing, they're tubes that you can place out um, and they collect, they passively collect potential pollutants. You can send them away to a lab and they can give you an idea of, of what's in your air. Um, in conservation, we also employ, this is kind of a more um, accessible, accessible in that a lab, a conservation lab that doesn't have a scientific laboratory and a GCMS column um, can do this if you have an oven and the, the right supplies. And it's called an Audi test. It's not a perfect test, but it's really, it's really great in terms of the fact that everybody can do this um, in a museum setting. And really what it is, is an, it's an accelerated aging test where you put the material. So say we're considering a material that we'll put into a showcase long period of time. And we're concerned if that might have a negative reaction with other materials in the case, um, specifically the things that we're displaying. So we take a sample of the material that we're considering displaying with our collection items and we put it through the artificial aging test and there are metal coupons in there and we examine the metal coupons and see the corrosion products and that indicates uh, whether there are pollutants in the air that we should be considering. Uh, it's really great if you can get archival acid-free boxes for your personal storage, but these are expensive. And there's a really great hack of using just a regular box 
and lining it with aluminum foil because that aluminum foil actually serves as a barrier layer to prevent the acids from coming through the, the box and into your collection items. Uh, uh, materials that you might want to consider when you're storing your collection items. Um, we typically recommend lignin free and acid free and 100% rag if possible, but 100% rag literally means like cotton. So as I mentioned before, a cotton sheet will do just fine. So the next risk I will talk about is light. You have all likely witnessed the effect of light damage to objects. Uh, items that are the most sensitive to light are objects with organic colorants. Light damage is cumulative and it is a direct function of exposure time, distance, and the light's intensity. We have ways to measure light with sensors and can also measure color change on objects to get an understanding of how the light is affecting our collections. Uh, this, is, this is what I'm doing here at, at Winterthur. We're using a colorimetry reading that where you can take precise readings of an area on this chair, for instance, and then we, I measured it again four months later um, to determine if there was any color change. And actually, fun fact, uh, there are apps you can get on your phone that do colorimetry. They were designed for the makeup industry so that you can figure out what color blush to get for you. Um, so it's, if you wanna experiment with that, um, by all means, you should definitely try that. Um, we also have light loggers. Um, there are ways to minimize the light um, using filters and shades, and those are great. Um, turning the lights off whenever possible, just putting um, minimize in, in museums, we like to create exhibition limits, um, limits for the light during exhibitions. And this is, this might sound kind of crazy, but if you have, I mean, you are the Decorative Arts Trust, if you have a lot of collection items, maybe it would be worth uh, rotating them on display, um, just so that you, they have a longer life in terms of the colors. This is a blue wheel standard. It's a, it's a pretty simple test. You can just place out uh, a piece of this uh, wool that um, has an ISO standard for the color change and how much light levels cause that certain amount of color change. Um, so that's just a pretty easy way to monitor cumulative light um, over time. Oh, and one thing I really want to um, make sure you all understand, and I'm sure you all do, um, is UV protecting glass. I think a lot of people think, oh, I have UV glass, like my print is, is saved. I can put it anywhere, uh, but that is actually not the case. It's really only filtering out UV light, which is an easy thing for us to filter out because we don't see it. And it does actually have the greatest amount of energy. So the great amount, greatest amount of damage um, but I know people that have prints with UV protecting glass uh, in right in front of the, the window and maybe that's not the best idea because it is still uh, receiving light. Water, next risk. Um, so the deterioration from water is probably one of the most common risks we deal with. Water can infiltrate our collections in a number of ways and can cause a lot of damage from tide lines, which is what you're seeing right here, which is when soiling and discoloration in a paper is solubilized. And then as the, the paper, as it moves across the paper and it dries, it creates this tide line. You can see this also happening in the furniture. But other things to consider are ancillary, the ancillary risks of say fire. So uh, you might in, re in return have a sprinkling, a sprinkler released on your collection. And another thing to consider is actually water can potentially be a physical force if you have flooding or if um, firefighters, for example, have to put out a blaze, which is obviously more important than the physical damage, but important to consider. Um, we can prepare for these collections emergencies by practicing salvage and recovery techniques for wet objects. It is good to solidify these techniques before an emergency happens because it can be quite uh, inspiring it can be quite instinctual for us to want to move quickly, but some materials are better off with a slow and deliberate approach. For example, it may seem counter, but wet paper that is stuck to other wet paper might actually benefit from being resubmerged back into the water so that you can split them more safely. That was news to me. Yeah, it is very important to take your time and breathe and think about it if you are dealing with a water emergency. And 
a lot of people think that once things are wet, they're done. Uh, that's certainly not the case. There are a lot of different salvage techniques you can use. Um, this is a, a picture from uh, a commercial salvage and recovery company called Belfour um, that can help if you have an emergency in your house. Um, they have large freezers and this is a, a, a freeze dryer, which is really great because you put the objects in there and it actually sublimates the water to the point where these objects come out dry. They're not perfect, um, but it's still, you know, if there's documents, you can still access them. And another thing you can do is if you are just overwhelmed by the amount of uh, wet things in your house and say there's like a stack of documents or photographs that you just don't have the time to separate and allow dry, you just don't have the space. Um, if you wrap them in plastic, um, like really securely wrap them, tape the plastic uh, and put it into the freezer, like your freezer, if your space, that actually just buys you a little bit more time when you have the means to take it out, let it thaw and then do your salvage and recovery. Okay, uh, this is thieves and vandals. This category of risks can be somewhat controversial as our society reckons with the idea of vandalism and what qualifies as such. Uh, there is a compelling case that artwork is not static and acts of vandalism in response to the meaning behind the sculpture or piece of art are actually just a continuation of that object's story. And I, for one, personally love that idea. There are some instances where vandalism is a little more agreed upon, and I do not think I need to explain theft. I think we all have a good sense of what that is. Many cultural institutions have the amazing benefit of having security staff to monitor the collection. I know I'm not alone when I say that these individuals have arguably one of the most important jobs in preventive conservation, and they are incredibly deserving of our praise. Sadly, humans have the, the capacity of causing significant damage and total loss to our collections. So um, this goes without saying, lock your home. Um, they have these nifty little security cameras we can start to use that can be helpful as well. And this is the final agent. We're on agent number 10. This is dissociation and neglect. Dissociation is when we lose important identifying information about an object or through poor data management, we lose entire files. Another instance of dissociation or neglect is if your storage is disorganized and you can't find the item you're looking for when you want it. Uh, another thing that's interesting to consider, uh, silverfish, just based on the way their mouth parts move, they graze along the surface of paper. Um, so they might actually eat off just the label, like what you wrote on the label, just so you have a, a blank label hanging from your object that's not really useful. Um, this is kind of a, a funny instance where somebody wrote uh, an accession number that happened to work both ways. Um, so these are just things to consider. Um, in museums, we manage dissociation through good policy, talented registrars and collections managers. Uh, it's a good idea to do an inventory. This goes with the emergency response, just to really have a sense of, of what you have, if possible, a collections management system. I'm sure there are some really great ones for uh, collectors. And uh, back up your files in a few different places, if possible, um, also, uh, on the cloud as well. Um, it's useful to label your objects. Um, you can do this with, you can create accession numbers, um, but also just think about, this is, a, this is a meaningful thing to think about is your photographs, uh, is to label the back of them, providing any kind of context uh, for who's in the picture, where's in the picture, why are you there? Because if you lose that information and you pass those photos onto your grandchildren, then that photo is be going to become meaningless if they don't know anything about that. So that was actually a really nice activity I did with my grandma as a way to learn about her past. I sat down with her, we looked through the photos, um, and then with a pencil um, on, a, on a very, on a soft surface with the, with the photo face down, maybe like on a piece of paper, um, you can uh, write the label in pencil, just write as much information as you can with your photographs. You really need to think about who's going to have these objects next and what information is relevant and how you can attach that information to the object, whether it's on a tag or in your database or on the back of a photograph. 
So I covered a lot of things and I hope it wasn't too overwhelming. I wanted to give you the opportunity to look at this and also screenshot this um, for your personal records. Uh, the first resource is the Canadian Conservation Institute that uh, came up with the 10 agents of deterioration. They have a, a wonderful website that goes into all of the agents of deterioration and, and management strategies for them. Uh, Stash C is also a great resource. It has tons of ideas for storage and display and for shipping. And uh, this is also a really great resource uh, you should definitely know about called, it's called Connecting to Collections Care. It's run through the Foundation of the American Institute for Conservation. And it is a, uh, sorry, it is a, a resource for people that have specific questions about preserving their collections. And it is a forum where you can ask any questions you want. There's hundreds of conservators and pr uh, preservation specialists that monitor that forum all the time. And you can ask any question you want. And they also put out a lot of really wonderful webinars and it's, it's great, you should know about it. Uh, museumpest.net, uh, if you are interested in setting up an IPM program in your home, um, this, this really has, it's a database that was created by people that work in the museum industry to identify the pests that we are really worried about that eat collections. And there's a lot of great tips about how to identify them. And there's also an email list if you're really interested where you can ask questions with photos of your pests and there are entomologists on, on call ready to answer the questions because they really enjoy identifying insects. Um, and then finally, this preventive, uh, preventive conservation wiki through AIC is also a great resource as well. Uh, since I just told you all about the agents of deterioration, I thought it would be interesting for you all if I just quickly explained my current project at the Smithsonian because it really involves all of the agents of deterioration. So I am the Samuel H. Kress Fellow uh, at a joint appointment between the National Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian Museum Conservation Institute. And my project this year is looking specifically at these large vertebrate specimens that are in open storage on open shelving in one of the, the large storage facilities, offsite storage facilities for the Smithsonian. And they are on open shelving just because of the practicality and expense of buying a large enclosure. Um, so what I'm doing is a quantitative risk analysis where I am going to look at all of the risks that might affect these um, objects on open storage. So, um, water, you know, because they're on open shelving, we might be worried about leaks from the pipes above. Uh, physical forces, people take a lot of tours through these uh, facilities and, you know, maybe somebody might be tempted to touch things. We hope they don't, but we can't prevent that entirely. Um, these, these objects are completely exposed to light. Um, thankfully, the lights do get turned off when you're not in there, but there are emergency lights that stay on all the time. Uh, the temperature and relative humidity um, the, it is pretty well controlled in there, but at any, I mean, the equipment is going to be changed at some point in the future and there's a risk of, you know, equipment failure always. And uh, thieves and vandal, hopefully that's not a big problem, but of course it can always be a risk. Uh, pollutants in the air, just kind of getting a sense of what might deteriorate the research value for these specimens and um, biodeterioration. Uh, there are also taxidermy specimens on open shelving, and those are certainly uh, a delicious snack for insects if they don't, if they aren't covered in pesticides. So I'm looking at all these risks and I'm gonna kind of come up with some potential options for other storage um, ways we can store these objects. And then I'm going to be able to weigh these risks. And a lot of these ideas of our risks are heuristic. So I'm really gonna put some data behind that to figure out what are actually the biggest risks and give the museum a decision tool to help them figure out the best option for storing these large specimens, which actually you know, relates a lot to other institutions that are also dealing with large objects, whether they're natural history or not. And um, I just wanted to introduce Becky Kaskowski, who's on this webinar with us right now. She is one of my supervisors for this project and she works at the Museum Conservation Institute. 
and she is a graduate of the Winterthur University of Delaware program in art conservation, where she majored in objects conservation with a specialization in natural history collections. Prior to starting at Winterthur, Becky received her master's in museum studies at George Washington University, and she is now MCI's very first preventive conservator. And I should say, uh, not everybody knows what MCI is. You, you know what the Natural History Museum is, but the Museum Conservation Institute is a Smithsonian unit that specializes in research, technical analysis, and conservation to support all of Smithsonian's collections. And this work is carried out independently and through collaborations, both internal and external to the Smithsonian. And I just wanted to thank you all for your time. Um, there are so many people to thank, but I really just uh, wrote down the people that specifically helped me create this presentation. I've given it uh, portions of it to other people as well, um, specifically in the conservation field, but it was nice to be able to adapt this to other people that aren't working necessarily in museums. Um, and I also put down my website if you are curious to learn a little bit more about some of the other research projects I've done. Um, you can peruse through that. And I also have a resource page on there that I regularly update with some of my favorite conservation resources. Hey, Melissa. So uh, a fantastic talk. And um, thank you for inviting me to be with you tonight. Um, I was hoping that I could um, chat with you a little bit. It's very clear from your presentation that you have a real passion for the field. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how you even learned about a field that is so small um, and, and how you, you ventured in. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question and one that I hear a lot. Um, I think when people find out about conservation, it, a lot of them are like, oh, that's great. I want to do that. Um, and that's certainly what happened to me. Uh, I was a studio art major my first year of college. And then I switched to become an art history major and a communication studies major because I thought I wanted to do like marketing and advertising. And uh, the, the art history was just kind of extra. But when I, uh, I was studying abroad in Florence and I learned about the field of art conservation, it was it just clicked for me because I've always kind of had a little bit of a math science mind. And this story is actually sounds really familiar to a lot of conservators actually it's just it's really accumulation of all your skills and interests and it's it's remarkable. Um, and I love it. Um, but it, it certainly was a long journey to get there. Um, and something worth mentioning because it's I, I don't think everybody has the privilege to to really do that. So yeah, I can definitely relate to exactly what you said. You know, it was wasn't until college that I learned about it. And then it was a long road uh, to actually get into school. Mm -hmm. um, dovetailing to that, um, what kind of advice would you have for for, you know, high school or college or even beyond that um, folks that are interested in potentially breaking into the field? Uh, well, two things. Um, one thing would, would, would I would try to get in touch with some of the graduate programs as soon as possible because I know they are making a lot of changes. Um, a lot of them were brought on about the, the pandemic, but a lot of them about racial justice, and they are really uh, reevaluating the way what they require of the people to get into graduate school. So um, it would be good to have a sense of what they are asking of the applicants at this stage. Um, but I think one of the best pieces of advice that I could give is really the importance of networking and reaching out to as many people working in this field as possible and gaining their perspective and keeping in touch with those people. Um, it's really helped me to have an enormous network at this point. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, so I know, um, you know, I probably entered the field about 10 years or so ago and, and you did mention, um, early on in your talk that preventive conservation is, um, becoming recognized as a specialty in its own right. And it's really been over probably the past 30 years or so that the field has been established as a subset and was nascent enough to actually launch the, the new um, major at Winneter and, and gain more momentum. 
what do you see as now some of the um, the ways that the field and preventive specifically is going over the next 30 years as we mature and become a more recognized discipline? Uh, a number, there's certainly a number of directions it's heading. Uh, one thing that really comes to mind first is uh, the importance of data science and really building those skills. It's not something that I realized initially, uh, but in preventive conservation, I mean, I just showed you a whole bunch of different types of loggers that we use to, to measure light and temperature and humidity. And all of that is giant data sets. And museums have been collecting data for quite a bit of time in most of their rooms. And we, we have an enormous wealth of data that can really inform our decisions in terms of thinking about sustainability with uh, the environmental control of the building, which historically museums have been really bad about. Um, we have unfortunately pushed an agenda to have a very narrow range of temperature and humidity because that is our understanding of the best uh, environment for collections. And there might be some more leeway in that. And, I, and we're really working to, to push that forward. Um, I think you would agree, Becky. And so yeah. the, if we can really use this data and there's like machine learning and I'm just starting to learn all of this and I find it fascinating, but you know, if we collect insect data and that data lives alongside the temperature and humidity data, that, that can inform, you know, we can start to model where, when we might have an insect infestation and where we might have a humidity problem where we don't have a sensor because certain insects are showing up. Um, and we can be more, as I mentioned, just more efficient with the way we manage our environment and not use too much energy. So, um, and, I, and the, what I also wanted to lead into from that is the importance of sustainability, um, environmental sustainability. Uh, we, if we don't have a planet, then we don't have our objects. It should, be, it should supersede everything that we do um, to focus on sustainability. And um, social, I was gonna say economic sustainability, which was another thing I wanted to mention. I had some pause about sharing all of the specific things we do in the museum world for preventive conservation, because a lot of these things aren't economically feasible for uh, a lot of institutions and for individuals. Um, so really just thinking a lot about alternatives and just, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's the, you know, even thinking about preventive conservation and being aware of your collection and the risks is more of a step than not thinking about it at all. And then socially sustained, social sustainability um, is crucial. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I really love preventive conservation is because I can do things like give this talk to you right now. Um, and I can give this talk to anybody and it, it, it basically is a love it's a it's leveling the playing field in terms of allowing everybody to preserve their own collections into the future instead of the kind of collections that we have in museums right now aren't necessarily representative of the entire human race. So we really need to work on preserving all of the collections or maybe not all, I mean, we can't be hoarders, we have to, <laughs> but, um, but really thinking critically and giving everybody the opportunity to preserve their collections is important. And I think, um, I think you make several very astute points with that and um, kind of leading from there, you're, you're now at this really interesting um, transition point in your career, transitioning from the heavy academics into more of the practical professional um, side of, of, of things, you know, where we all miss the academic side eventually, trust me. Um, but my, my question, it relates to um, sitting here now, what is one of your dream projects that you would love to do um, or um, a dream collection uh, to work with? Mm. Uh, so I think there's 
kind of a lot. I mean, a preventive conservator is honestly an umbrella term for a lot of different paths that you can take. Like you could potentially be an IPM specialist. You could potentially be someone that just focuses on light. Um, but there's also different strategies um, that you can employ preventive conservation, whether it's through research um, and through actual implementation, um, maybe in a museum as like an exhibits conservator, um, which is maybe somebody that sits at the table during exhibition planning meetings and really is the voice of the objects and kind of, you know, curators can have these really great ideas for how they want to display things. Um, but, you know, but, but not, I don't want to be a person that uh, tells you no, you know, conservators really need to work with you and, and figure out the best ways to make things work. Uh, but also communicating the risks and really making sure everybody understands why maybe certain things aren't the best idea. Uh, so answering the question, what I kind of see myself doing more, I think really uh, would largely be something more in a communication role. I really like uh, meeting new people and um, teaching and explaining the risks and making people more aware of preventive conservation. <laughs> I, just, I hear, I, I smile because I hear a lot of myself echoed back. Um, it's a, it's a lot of the same reasons I wanted to, that, that this position was so attractive to me. It was exactly that advocacy role, um, being able to, to not say no, to not be a gatekeeper, but rather to be a creative problem solver with all of the stakeholders that, that do have ownership to these collections and we should be using them. So yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, so, one last question I, I wanted to kind of tease at you is that you have now significant amount of experience in the field combined with your um, pre-program experience, your, your work as an independent artist, your training in the conservation program, and then your fellowships. What has been your favorite project um, over the years? It could be interventive treatment. It could be preventive. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, I think that would have to be a project that I did in my second year um, at Winterthur, which is with, uh, it was a, a local high school called Central High School in Philadelphia. And they had an amazing collection of artwork and cultural heritage objects displayed all around their school. So it was really, it was really fun, not only working with the objects, but primarily working with the students and getting them excited about conservation and teaching them uh, preventive conservation techniques, like housekeeping and um, how to monitor for pests and that sort of thing. It was really, it was, it was cool because I got to teach to, uh, I got to teach um, in the environmental science class where they were learning about integrated pest management in the agricultural field and their minds were blown that this is something that we implement in museums. Um, so it was a really great project. That's awesome. Did the students teach you anything? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, you put me on the spot. I'm trying to think of something that they taught, but I mean, I actually, you know what I taught, I learned from them was effective ways to communicate um, to people that might not have the attention span of someone that could, you know, go to school for a few years. Um, they, they, they told me, they said, YouTube videos are the best, shorter ones are better. Um, if you specify which YouTube's videos to watch to include um, how long that YouTube video is, because if you open it up and it's like a 20 minute video, like you're not going to watch that. So sure. Those one. are great tips. Yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, well, I do see that there are some questions in the chat. Carrie, did you want me to turn it over to you? Yes, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to field some of these at both of you. Um, and I know I'm not allowed to have favorite children, but this has been one of my favorite trust talks by far. Um, <laughs> so uh, the first question I want to ask um, is about finding a conservator for your private collection. Um, how do you go about 
making sure that the person that you are hiring to do a treatment um, is the best for that role and has the right qualifications and can really take care of your object. Becky, you wanna answer that? Sure. Um, so um, conservators, we have um, our professional uh, national organizations, the American Institute for Conservation. And on our website, um, there is what's called the Find a Conservator tool. And um, they've just made some new um, modifications to it to actually improve its usability. Um, but you just type in a few um, search criteria if you're looking for paintings person or somebody who works on ceramics. Um, and you can type in general geographic area or if people are willing to travel. And what's nice about that tool is it is actually only um, members of the organization who are what we call um, peer reviewed members, um, either a professional associate or a fellow um, are listed within this tool. So um, the client or the customer has the assurance to know that these are individuals who have gone through a rigorous peer review process to vet both their ethical and technical abilities. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and we do have a few questions from the audience. Let's start with what is the scariest risk for you? Is there anything that you've come across that you just said, oh no? Uh, or what is the worst thing that you've ever seen? <laughs> I think it's moths. Moths, yeah. They're so gross. <laughs> and that's why I like IPM because you can like, you can control it. You feel like you have a yeah. sense of control. For me, I'd have to say um, fire is is definitely my, my number one fear as like a human, um, like the firefighters came in elementary school and gave us our talk and I was already hooked then and there that I was gonna do everything I could do in my life to reduce fire risk. Um, and that I've carried with me throughout. And, and you know, it's sad um, as, as like a natural sciences conservator, how I, you know, cut my teeth in the field. Um, a lot of people have like the misperception that fossils, for instance, are just rocks or stone and, you know, they can't burn. And, and that's false. There have been many collections that have been um, just completely decimated by fire. Um, you know, as a conservator, if, if a ceramic falls, yes, it's damaged. And yes, we can break or we can fix it. Yes, there may be some evidence of that past damage, but fire, there's nothing left for me to to actually intervene with, it's just gone. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that attics and basements are not good because of pests, but more high traffic areas may be dangerous because of light, water spills, bumps and scuffs, et cetera. How do you weigh the options and balance the best location for an object? Mm. <laughs> That's a tricky one. Um, What do you think, Becky? <laughs> well, I mean, I think this is where where you end up with, you have to do a little bit of a cost benefit analysis with yourself. And, um, and, and this is kind of the foundation of, of what Melissa was talking about with quantitative risk assessment. No, not everybody has to do quantitative risk assessment on every collection and every object um, that you own. But you should be having these questions, asking yourself, like, what is the, the most severe and most frequent and most expected type of, um, you know, risk that you expect to have and how well can you control or mitigate them in a given scenario? Um, so for me, my basement is a finished basement. So yeah, I do store some stuff down there because it's a, an active living space, um, but I might, you know, I, I also have a cat, which I'm not sure if you can hear him, but he's meowing very angrily. Um, so I also try to put things on shelves where he can't climb and doesn't go to. And, and I think through that process, um, but I, I hope that answers the question a little bit. It's, it's just that, that cost benefit and trying to rationalize with yourself, which one is the greatest threat here, and which can you control the most? 
That's a good question. <laughs> it's something that we have to deal with often. There's a lot yeah. of heuristics in what we do. And if we can put more quantitative examples and really think you know, about the probability of certain things as best as we can, then we're gonna do a better job. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, definitely. Um, I want to make sure that we are cognizant of everyone's time and I have something else to share while we close up. up. Um, thank you both so much for participating in this trust talk. Like I said, this has been one of my favorites so far. It is so great to share Melissa's work and you truly do. You can tell that you love communicating because you're really great at it. So thank you so much for sharing this lecture um, and please see us in 2021 for our next trust talk, which we will start promoting next week. Um, and tomorrow we are opening registration for our Americana week programming. We may not be able to go to New York this year um, to see all of the amazing auctions and galleries, but we will be bringing a series of tours to you at home. So please check that out tomorrow on the Decorative Arts Trust website. And thank you again to both Melissa and Becky. Have a lovely evening and happy holidays, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for having me. All right.